Um, bear with my voice uh, this morning. Uh, we spent uh, 15 hours uh, at the ball field yesterday, literally 15 hours from 9 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night. And uh, my voice is shot from encouraging and motivating. That's what I call it, motivating. <clears throat> Ten-year-old boys. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, no, we're so thankful for that. The good news is you play those one-day tournaments, I get to be here this morning, amen, with all of my family and my church family. And so, uh, we're excited to be here. We're tired, but God is good. Where we're physically tired, he, he uplifts our spirit and energizes our spirit, amen? And so, we are, are so thankful, thankful to be here. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with us to Acts chapter 28, Acts chapter 28, we'll start in verse 28 is where we'll get to eventually, but <clears throat> before we get there, um, those of you that have been a part of our men's and women's connect group, you know that uh, we've been studying the book of Acts, we finished that up and, and we went through through the book of Acts, and, and uh, just to kind of uh, recap uh, what, what uh, we talked about for maybe some of those of you that, that were unable to, uh, to make it, um, Acts is a sweeping account of the birth of Christianity or the rise of the church. And uh, it begins with the ascension of Christ back to the Father after his death, burial, and resurrection. And then ends with the Apostle Paul writing letters while under Roman house arrest. Uh, it's the story of a handful of disciples who turned the world upside down with their message of love forgiveness, and salvation through Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, it's quite the, the story and adventure if you really take time to, to dive into it and, and read about it and ask God to, to reveal things to you. But it may be the very final words of Acts that leaves us with the greatest clue for how to live as followers of Christ in this modern world. It's also an awesome blueprint of how we should operate as God's church. How we should operate as God's church. The things that they did uh, uh, as they followed the guidance and the lead of the Holy Spirit and Jesus' teachings. Uh, how we should uh, encourage and edify and be there for one another as God's church. And we know from past messages and, 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 and scripture that the church is made up of not bricks and mortar of you, of each one of us, is the church. And so um, Acts is a, a tremendous example. But, but today we're going to look at the, the final word, at least one of the final words uh, that, that Paul um, uh, uh, had in, in Acts that, that Luke uh, wrote down. And so uh, uh, if you turn to, um, to Acts chapter 28, I'm going to uh, jump down to verse 31. I'm going to read that. We'll jump back up to 28 here in just a second. But, but verse 31 says, Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now that's New King James Version uses that word forbidding. But if you study that word out, if you look that word up uh, in the Greek, it is aklolotos. And what that means is unhindered, unhindered. So, so um, unhindered uh, may be the last word of Acts, but it's the first word for those who put their hope, faith, and trust in the risen King Jesus. And so I want you to begin to think about uh, uh, unhindered. Uh, who here has ever felt hindered? Maybe you felt held back in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you felt like you had more to give or more to offer. Amen. You ever been in situations? I've definitely been in situations where I felt like uh, uh, maybe your, your time, your talent, your energy wasn't being used and you felt like you had more to offer, more to contribute. What about in your faith? What about in your, 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 your faith walk? Have you ever felt like there was something more? Be careful what you ask for. But have you ever felt like that there was, there was something more? Uh, some piece that you may have been missing out on as you read through the Gospels or, or even Acts. Uh, the miracles, the healings, the transformation, the boldness, the boldness of the early church. And what I, what I, what I think is sometimes 
uh, God's church, not just Cornerstone, but God's church in general, we've lost some of that boldness under the lie of being politically correct. We've lost some of our bold under the lie of the enemy that, that we won't be popular. Who cares? I never was a popular guy, so I'm not chasing it now, right? And so we've lost, uh, in some instances, the boldness that the early church has. And maybe, maybe sometimes that's, that's left you wanting for more. If, that's, if that sounds like you, we okay up there? If that sounds like you, I've got, I've got good news. I've got good news for you today. Good news for you today. You're not alone. Over the centuries, over the centuries, um, this is something that, that, God's people, that God's people have dealt with uh, and, and considered and, and pondered um, and thought a lot about. In fact, the entire uh, Reformation movement uh, from the 16th century was rooted in this idea, in this thought that something was missing in their experience and the experiences of the people of God. They knew that there was more. They knew that there was more. And so I began to think about being hindered. I began to think about being hindered. And, and, the, and the thought that came to my mind or the picture that came to my mind was a thoroughbred racehorse. Just a few weeks ago, not too long ago, there was the Kentucky Derby, right? And, and in, that, in that, I thought of those thoroughbreds standing just behind the starting gate. You can, you can, you can probably, anybody ever here watch Kentucky Derby or horse racing or any of that? You can, you can look at that and you see the horses. They're waiting for that gate to be open. Some of them don't even want to go in that gate. It's hard to get them in that because they know that gate is going to hinder them from what they were bred to do, which was run. That's their purpose, is to run. And so I got that, I got that picture of, of that, of, of, of a racehorse and, and, and being put into that, that starting gate. And then once that gate opens, the horse running free, beautiful and majestic. Amen? Amen? And then I thought about that, and I thought, man, how, how much of an obstacle and how much of a hindrance that starting gate must be to those horses. But then as they're running, there's some, there's some other thoughts that came to my mind. Remember, we're talking about being unhindered. Man, as soon as that gate opens up and they're flying, they are unhindered. They are released to go free down the track. But notice something. There's still a guardrail on the inside, and there's still a fence on the outside. Right. So while they're free, remember I preached a message, uh, I don't know, it's been a while ago about freedom fences. They're free, but they're not free to do anything. They're free to fulfill their purpose of running down the track, of racing, of racing. See, we're going to talk about freedom here in just a little bit. We are not, it's not a free for all. It's not a, I can go and do whatever I want to do and be okay. No, there's freedom fences and there's a purpose in which God created each and every single one of us to fulfill freely. And that's what unhindered means is that, is that I can fulfill God's purpose in my life freely and openly and not be hindered in that, in that freedom. And I thought about those those racehorses. And then, and then not only are there, there fences on the inside and the outside, not only are there guardrails to keep that horse in its lane or on the track that it was created to run on, right? There's also what? A jockey encouraging that horse, motivating that horse to do what it was created to do. That's the Holy Spirit motivating us encouraging us, guiding us, leading us to be unhindered in our walk and in our faith with Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ. And so I have to ask the question, what is holding you back today, if anything? And maybe you can sit here and say, well, there's nothing holding me back. I'm unhindered. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to, to run free in my purpose that God has created me for. But what about us as a church? What is holding us back as a church? Are the obstacles that, that the enemy creates or tries to throw in our way, like political correctness, holding us back? Are we too much, are we too worried about being ridiculed and unpopular 
And is that holding us back? Are we hindered by the world's view of Christianity? Is that holding us back from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? From living the gospel of Jesus Christ? Out loud, out loud. What more does God have for us to experience in our faith if we will live unhindered? If we will break out of the gate and run and run. So as you think about those questions, as you, as you ponder those in your heart, as you roll those around in your mind, I'm excited to kick this series off today, uh, this four-week series. As If you haven't guessed, if you, if you haven't noticed yet, it's called Unhindered. And so I'm excited to, to kick that off. We're going to start here, uh, uh, like I said, in the, in the book of Acts and starting uh, be our starting point. We're going to unpack several of the ways we are called to, to uh, called and released to live unhindered lives of faith. Unhindered lives of faith. Back over at Acts. Let's read, uh, let's read 28, 28 through 31. Therefore... Let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. In other words, the salvation of God. What does that mean? What is the salvation of God? Here's what it simply means. Rescue, deliverance, safety, liberation, release, uh, 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 preservation. There we go. I'll spit it out. Preservation. Bear with me. I've been up since 1 o'clock. I didn't get to go to bed until 1 o'clock. Preservation. So in other words, the salvation of God, it saves me. It saves me and it gives me purpose. It helps me fulfill my purpose. And now I, I, I have no doubt there's somebody sitting there or somebody listening online and said, well, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my purpose is. We make that word and we make that thought so difficult and it's really so easy. Your number one purpose, the reason that you were created was to be in relationship with God. That's it. That's your purpose. That's why you live, breathe, and have a heartbeat. is to be in relationship with God, your creator. That's it. And then the things that come from that, he will reveal to you through the power of the Holy Spirit when you're in an appropriate relationship with him. If you're not in an appropriate relationship with God, you don't know your purpose. Because you've got to be in relationship with him before you can fulfill any purpose. Does it make sense? Makes sense. And so here in the Acts is saying, let it be known to you that the salvation of God, the preservation, the deliverance, the rescue, the saving of God has been sent to the Gentiles. That means all of us. That means it is, it is open to every single person in the world. Has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And they will hear it. Verse 29, and when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. See, the Jews had an obstacle. They had an hindrance, their old way of thinking, the, 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 the law and the, some of the things that they, they had been taught. And I'm not going to dive too deep into that. You can study that out, what was hindering the Jews and why they had such a great dispute among themselves. And then verse 30, it says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in, a, in his own rented house and received all who came to him. All who came to him. And that's one thing, that's one blueprint of a church. Anybody that wants to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ is welcome in this building. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you sound like. I don't care who your parents were or weren't. I don't care how much money you have in the bank or don't have in the bank. I don't care what kind of car you drive or, or what kind of shoes you walked here in. Doesn't matter. Anybody that wants to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ is welcome at the Cornerstone Church. Amen. Amen. And so here, verse 31, I'm going to read it again. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Confidence in himself? No. Confidence in the message of Jesus Christ. At some point, we've lost the confidence in the message of Jesus Christ. It's the message of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel's that lead to a relationship with God, with God, preparing the kingdom of God or preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the, the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. No one 
forbidding him or no one hindering, unhindered faith that Paul had when he done this. Acts serves as a vital link between the Gospels and the Epistles. Now, I've got to explain that if you don't understand the difference between the Gospel and the Epistles. Gospels, Jesus is preaching. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus is preaching. Jesus is teaching. The words of Jesus Christ. The Epistles, Jesus is being preached. Right? Jesus is being preached. Jesus is being taught about. It bridges the gap between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And the Christ of faith. Acts is filled with references to God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. The story simply would not have been possible without God. And guess what? Your story would not be possible without God. Your story would not be possible without God. He started it, he motivated it, and he gives it direction, energy, purpose, message, and protection. And protection. Luke does not give us a systematic description of God, but he describes what God did with his church and what God still wants to do with his church today. With his church today. In Acts, everything points to Christ and his church. It's story after miraculous story of God's provision, power, and protection. Of his church. Of his church. It's Peter and John preaching to the Jewish Sanhedrin. It's all the believers being of one heart and one mind. And what was that one heart and one mind? To share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live it out loud. To be that light. That's one of our purposes. That's our hashtag. Shine. For us to shine. One mind and one accord. Does that mean we're going to like everything? Some of you probably don't like baseball. At 10 o'clock at night, I wasn't liking it so much. I was ready for my bed. We may have different likes and different things that we enjoy, but we should still be in one mind and one accord. And that one mind and one accord is our love for Jesus Christ. That's what holds us all together. That's what holds us all together is our love for Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ, one heart and one mind. The, the first church, the first, the first people uh, that, that, that took up the cross of spreading the gospel around the world, they were willing to sell all their possessing and sharing everything with one another. And I oftentimes ask myself, man, if God, if the Holy Spirit comes to me and says, sell everything you got, give it to the poor or whatever. You know, there's a story in the Bible of Jesus' preaching. When a rich young man came to him and said, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? He said, sell everything you got, give it to the poor and follow me. Well, you never hear about that man again because why? He was unwilling to do that. He was unwilling to do that. And what he doesn't realize was if he would have sold what, what he thought he had here in this world, Jesus would have blessed him a thousand times over. A thousand times over. And so... Um, um, that the, the, the willingness to give all, the willingness to give all, to be unhindered. That's a church that was unhindered, unhindered. So you look at the, the example of, of, the, of the first church, and, and, and I think about some of the things that I'm going to, and, and I'm probably going to get 200 emails tomorrow for, for this example. And Amy's nervous. Look at her. She's already looking away. She's, she's nervous. She's looking down at the ground like, oh, oh my Lord, what is he going to do now? Right? But I'm going to use, I'm gonna use our, 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 our C, C kids. Amazing, amazing. They're growing. They're growing. They're growing. You saw them all up here this morning, taking up a whole row. Sometimes they take up two rows, two rows. It's summertime, summer slump, vacation, everything. Anyway, I won't get off on that. That's another thing I'll get emails about. But here we go. Um, and so, packed back there, out of room, out of room. Need more room. Don't have it in the budget to create more room right now. We could use that. We could use that to hinder us. Oh, we got too many kids. No, we don't. Praise God we're out of room. Praise God we're out of room. We could be standing on a street corner begging kids to come in here, begging families to bring their children to Cornerstone Church. Praise God we're out of room. 
Oh, the classes are too full. I don't have enough teachers. Praise God the classes are full. Praise God I don't have enough teachers to teach all the kids that God is blessing Cornerstone Church with. Here's the one I'll get the emails about. Oh, the kids are ornery. Some of these kids act like they ain't never been in church before. Praise God! We got kids that act like they ain't never been in church before. Because it's our job to teach them. Quit letting that be a hindrance and get up and teach them. And teach them. Quit standing at the starting gate and bust that thing open and run. And run. Pastor D at cornerstonechurch.com or whatever, uh, Gmail. Pastor Cornerstone, well, I don't know. Mary, help me out. I don't even know what the email is. Ask Mary. She knows. She'll send it to you. But you get my point. We can sit back and we can let all kinds of things, I just use that as an example. We can sit back and we can, we can let all kinds of things hinder us. Reasons why not to. Reasons why this is hard. Well, guess what? Jesus never said being a Christian would be easy. He never said being the church would be easy. He just promised to give us the strength, the courage, and the boldness, and the perseverance to do what we were called to do. To do what we were called to do. That word, that word. And then, and then you look at, you look at Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. Saul's conversion to Paul. Oh, man, I love that. I love that. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, after, after Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, after I, after I, I hopefully, uh, 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 I want to see them first. We'll see them first, and then some loved ones. And then I'm going to find Paul. I'm going to find Paul and say, man, you, ministry was amazing, but there's some of the things you wrote that I was like, dude, you, why would you have to say it like that? Because it took me like four weeks to try to figure out exactly what you're saying, Right? But, but Paul's writing was, and, and man, Paul was a bulldog. Come on, you Wagner folks. Paul was a bulldog. Paul was a bulldog when he was persecuting Christians. Huh? And Paul was a bulldog when, when Jesus changed his life. When God changed his life on his road to Damascus. He wasn't going to let anything stop him from what God, what Jesus, what the Holy Spirit called him to do. Even up into death physical because he knew that what he had waiting on him this world paled in comparison to what he had waiting on him and he understood the importance of being unhindered in the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ he was not afraid Christians we got to stop being afraid of the consequences of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because the consequences of not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, of not living out the gospel of Jesus Christ is a lot greater. Is a lot greater. Is a lot greater. So that one word in the book of Acts brings it all together, unhindered. So what's going on in that passage right there that I read, those four verses? Paul was sent by Agrippa and Festus to Rome where he waited two years to be seen by Caesar. Paul sitting under house arrest. House arrest. He could, uh, that could have been a hindrance. Like, I can't get out. I can't move around. I can't get out. I can't go on any, any more uh, journeys, any more missionary journeys. I'm under house arrest. I can't move around. But what did it say? He received all who were sent to him. And guess what? You may be sitting here this morning and be saying, well, I don't know a lot of people. My circle of influence uh, isn't that great? I'm going to tell you something. If you pray and you, and you have a thirst and a hunger and a desire to share Jesus with, with people, they're going to be sent to you. God's going to send them to you. And we've got to be prepared for the opportunity. We've got to be prepared for the opportunity. Paul's sitting under, he, he rents a house. And most likely, you can study this out, he rents out, most likely that house was funded by the members of the church. You think Paul had any money? He was under house arrest. Couldn't do anything. Another example of God's people being willing to give. And he welcomed anyone and everyone who came to him. He was preaching and teaching just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus did. He was obeying the great commission. 
The Great Commission. Simply put, go out and share. Go out and share the Word of God. Go out and share. Each one of you have a story. Each one of you have a testimony. And you're to share it. That's part of your purpose, to share it, because it's unique to you. It's unique to you. And your story might just touch somebody else and spark the beginning of their story. Of their story. Paul had openness, boldness, and confidence. Openness, boldness, and confidence. Confidence not in himself. Confidence in his Savior. Somewhere we've lost the confidence in our Savior. Don't we think God can handle anything this old world throws our way? Let them put us in prison. Guess what? We'll have a prison ministry. He did this unhindered when he could have sat back and been hindered. When he could have sat back and threw himself a pity party for the things that he was going through in this life. He writes about that. You can read about it. He did this unhindered. The very last word in the book of Acts. Unhindered. Paul wrote four prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says this. Be careful. Be very careful. Then. How you live. Remember, freedom fences. Not as unwise, but wise. Where does wisdom come from, somebody? You can, you can be, be bold, be confident, be open. God, where do I, if I, if I, the Lord, if I want wisdom, what do I got to do? I got to ask it of the Lord because I can't get it. There's no book. There's no self-help class. There's no college or university. No high school, no elementary school that's going to give me wisdom. They might give me some knowledge, but only wisdom comes from God. And we got to ask Him for it every single day. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Man, I've, I've had opportunities in my life that I've missed. That I've missed. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit convicted me big time. I, I couldn't sleep. Because I missed an opportunity to share with somebody my testimony, the story that, that God has given me, to, to, to reach out to them and maybe, maybe help them along in their story or to begin their story. And I missed it and I let go of it or, or I acted in a way that hurt my testimony. Right? Ask 10 year old boys. And God convicts you. Because I missed an opportunity. Be ready and open and your eyes wide open to every opportunity. Because they're there. They're there. And then be bold and confident in those opportunities. Be bold and confident in those opportunities. Finishing out Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. The days are evil. wants a generation to stand up and be bold and confident and unwavering in your faith, unhindered in your faith, unhindered in your faith, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. It goes from be wise to do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. There's God's permissive will, and then there's his perfect will. Permissive will is how because he sits back and says, hey, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Several years ago in the United States of America, we decided we didn't want God in schools. We stepped back. We didn't fight it hard enough. We weren't bold enough. We weren't courageous enough. And guess what? First of all, I want to tell you, if you're school age, God can be in school because if you have God in your heart, he's walking into that school with you. Amen. And you can pray it any time you want to. Teachers, back me up on that, right? Amen? Amen? And so, um, um, but we, we, we as a nation decided that. Look at the shake. Look at what's happened. God's a judge. That's his, that's his permissive will. We got a free will. It gives us a free will. We willed that. That's what we thought we wanted. 
us, us as God's people, when bold and courageous enough, we step back, let that happen. God's permissive will, God's perfect will was that we still prayed every morning in school. But his permissive will, and then what happens? Okay, that's what you're, God's a gentleman. Hey, I'm not going to force you to be in relationship with me. I'm not going to force you to do the things that I desire for you to do. I want you to pick it up. What kind of a relationship is a forced relationship anyway? It's not a relationship at all. So you get his permissive will. You look at the, you look at the shape and the, some of the things that, that's taking place in, in some public schools. In some public schools because his permissive will say, okay, you don't want me there, I won't be there. But you better be ready for what's coming next. United States of America, we don't want God. We don't want to be a godly nation anymore. We don't want to be a godly nation anymore. You better be ready for what's coming next. God's people need to stand up, unhindered, unafraid, unapologetic for standing on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time to run. It's time to run for the kingdom of God. Not for myself. Not so Cornerstone Church becomes some big thing. I don't care about that. We time to run for the kingdom of God. It's time to run for the kingdom of God. And then we think, oh, adversity, adversity, adversity. You know, I, I know, I, I know I'm, I'm talking probably too much about my 10-year-old boys, but in baseball, you will find adversity. Sailor, on the softball field, there will be a point where there's adversity. And you got a, you got a choice. You can either wilt like a flower or you can stand up and fight. You wilt like a flower, guess what? You lose. God's people, we got to quit wilting like flowers. We got to stand up and we got to fight in the name of Jesus Christ. He wants warriors. He wants warriors for his gospel. He wants bold faith for his gospel, for his kingdom. Adversity is an opportunity. Adversity is an opportunity. Adversity is an opportunity. You are not hindered by adversity. You want to get sometimes, sometimes adversity is the work of the enemy. Sometimes adversity is God's will. Why? So that we're stronger on the other side of that ad adversity. So that we're stronger on the other side of that adversity. And I've let adversity at times hinder my ministry. Sometimes I look at the what ifs too much. Oh, what if this? What if we do this? What if we do that? And it hinders me because, oh, if we do that, then this, this, and this could happen. And I don't know. That might just be fear. But you let the what ifs, you let the possibility of adversity stop us from being bold and courageous and unhindered in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you look at these words and you look at Paul's writings and these are words from a man that was at peace with his God. See, another thing that hinders us is when we're not at peace with our God. When we got things going on in our hearts, our minds, and our spirit that cause us not to be at peace with our God. Those of you that are married, raise your hand. Don't be scared. Those of you that want to be married, raise your hand. Those of you that are, are not married and never want to be married again, don't raise your hand. <laughs> right? So those of you that are married or have been married or never want to be married again, you understand adversity. I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, whew. It's a whole lot better when Amy and I are at peace, <laughs> right, you know, than it is when there's issues, when there's things that I'm doing or she's doing that, that, that kind of, that, that tests that peace, right? It's a whole lot better for you to be at peace with God. It's a whole lot better for you to be at peace with God. Paul was at peace with God and that gave him the ability that freed him up that unhindered him to be bold courageous and confident in his God in his God content in who God created him to be content in who God created him to be we're not all the same we don't want to be the same that would be boring if there was a room full of pastor D's 
Thank you. Somebody finally agrees with what I'm preaching. I won't get any emails on that one. Right? It'd be boring. It'd be boring. We're all unique. We're all created for a unique purpose and a unique role and a unique opportunity in God's family. And it takes every single one of us, just like at the beginning in Acts, in the first church, it took every single one of them. Those thousands that were being converted, those thousands that were entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, God knew, the disciples knew, the apostles knew. It took every single one of them to further the kingdom. It takes every single one of us here at Cornerstone Church doing what God has called us to do, fulfilling our purpose. Fulfilling our purpose. He was content. Paul was operating as a free man. As a free man under house arrest, he was the freest man in the land at that time. One of the freest men in the land. Even under house arrest, he was one of the freest men at that time. The very last word of Acts could very well be the first word of faith for all those who believe, unhindered. Galatians 5 and 1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Sometimes we try and put those, those things that hinder us back, back on. The enemy's real good at reminding me of my mistakes last night at 10 o'clock. He's real good at reminding me of my mistakes when I was outside of God's perfect will for my life. He's real good at trying to wrap those chains of bondage back around me. Don't go back to those things. You've been set free. You've been set free. That has been broken and you have been set free. That gate has been opened wide by your Savior Jesus Christ and you don't have to back up into it. You don't have to back up into it. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bond. John 8 and 36. John 8 and 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Why do I like the New King James, New King James Version? Because I like the word shall, because you can circle it, you can underline it, you can take it to the bank. It is a promise. If Jesus has set you free, he promises that you will not only be free, but you will be free indeed. That means I don't have to entangle myself with that garbage anymore. I don't have to live that life anymore. I'm unhindered and bold and courageous in my salvation, in my rescue. Free to believe that God can and will act on behalf of others. You praying for somebody right now? You're free to believe that God is going to intervene, that God is going to do what you're asking Him to do. He says, knock, and I'll answer does that mean he answers it in every single way that we want him to? No, but his way's perfect anyway. His way's higher than mine. I don't want my way. I want your way, God, and I'm free. Free to ask it. Free to come to Jesus with anything. Free to come to Jesus with anything. Sometimes, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I think, man, I don't want to bother God with that. I don't want to bother Jesus with that. He's got so much bigger things. He wants you to come to him in everything. The big, the small, and the in-between. The big, the small, and the in-between. Free to come to Jesus with anything. Free to approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. With boldness and confidence. No longer do you have to go behind the veil. No longer do you have to go to somebody that then has to go behind the veil and pray on your behalf. Yeah, it's good to encourage and, and reach out and have other brothers and sisters in Christ pray with you and battle with you in prayer. But you can go to God yourself. You can go to your God yourself. We are free to live as beloved sons and daughters no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in. No matter what circumstance Paul found himself in, he was a son and a child of God the Father. Of God the Father. Free to enjoy the lives that God has given us. Free to enjoy the lives that God has given. Free to count everything else as loss compared to the greatness of knowing Christ. The greatness of knowing Christ. With all that said, 
the sad truth is that many of us become disillusioned with our faith. We lose our wonder of God, our awe of God. Maybe we've lost our awe of God. Certainly as a whole, generally speaking, a nation, we have lost our awe, our wonder of God. We lose sight of our first love. Think back to the time when you first entered into a relationship with God. Man, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get back to the auto parts store and tell my manager what had just happened in his auto parts truck. We lose sight of our first love. A lot of us put the chains of our former lives back on. Obviously, no one here wants to return back to their enslaved life of sin and death. But the reality is we do oftentimes become disillusioned. We do get our feelings hurt when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want Him to. We lose our awe and wonder of God. We become hindered by our hurt and our unmet expectations. Go back to marriage. Men, I can assure you, your wife has some expectations. And if they are unmet, peace may not be an option. But sometimes God doesn't meet what we want. And it hurts our feelings. And then we lose our awe of God. We lose our awe of God. We are hindered by our hurt and unmet expectations. Sometimes. Sometimes we hurt each other, and we don't live up to the expectations of a family of God. And it can hinder a church from moving forward, from moving forward. But I want to reiterate something that, that the, the example that I gave earlier, when I think of being hindered, imagining the, the thoroughbred racehorse standing just behind the starting gate, waiting for it to open. Once that gate opens up, that horse is running free, beautiful, majestic. That race horse is meant to run, but the gates hinder its movement and freedom. The gate is an obstacle. The gate is an obstacle, holding the horse back from what it's intended to be. I ask you again today, what is holding you back? What is holding you back? What obstacles are hindering your faith? What obstacles are hindering your faith? Are you running free in your faith today? Are you running free in your faith today? Remember, the beauty of being set free and the glory of being loved is that we can always return to the Father. Maybe you've gotten off track. Maybe you've gotten off track. Maybe you know sitting here today that you're not fulfilling the purpose that God has intended you. Maybe you're outside a relationship. With God. You can come back today. That's the great thing about the God I serve and the Savior is I can come back. I can come back. We can always return to Christ. And so today, I want to invite you into the unhindered kingdom of God. The unhindered king, where God has lavished his love and his grace and his mercy over all of us. Over all of us. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time. Or maybe, just as a good reminder, never forget that if the Son has set you free, then you are free indeed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. For each and every person that's here this morning, we pray, dear Heavenly Father, you bless them for their efforts to come and to be a part of your service, to be a part of your church, Lord. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to live unhindered in your kingdom. Give us a boldness and a courage and a confidence, Lord, to go out into this world, Lord, and to share, and to share your word and to share your gospel confidently and boldly. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for Cornerstone Church specifically that you would give us boldness and, and, and courage, Lord, that you would help us to uplift each other, to encourage each other, to run this race with each other, to be unhindered in your purpose for this church. Lord, help us to be a loving people. Help us to be a forgiving people. Help us to be a people that show grace to one another. Lord, we just pray that whatever it is Uh, that may be present in anyone's life here that is hindering them and their walk with you that is hindering them from coming to you 
that today would be the day that those chains are broken. In Jesus' name, amen.